name is Suzanne Price, and I am your presenter today. And I have a very interesting topic that I'd like to discuss with you about the Great Pyramid as an example of ancient high tech. And uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank the Caritas Center for allowing me to do this and working with them and Gloria Coho. So let us begin. Here we are. I would like to introduce you to some new ideas about the Sphinx, the Great Pyramid of Giza, and the ancient Egyptians. And what I'm about to share with you may suggest a kind of a change of point of view or a paradigm shift. Now, I'm first going to give you a little bit of background, and then I'm going to talk about the Sphinx and the dating, which will also help us in dating the Great Pyramid. Most people have a very romantic view of the Great Pyramids of the Giza Plateau, and so do I. And every time I think of it, I imagine the way it must have been. Now, if you look at this like I do, I tend to think of the Great Pyramids like with background music of Lawrence of Arabia, the camels, the sand, and so forth. It's a very romantic view. But in actuality, the truth of the matter is it's very different. First, let me point out to you that most people make the mistake of thinking that the Pyramid of Khafra, which does have a limestone cap to it, is actually the Great Pyramid, but it is not. This is deceiving because of the way the three pyramids, Khufu, Khafre, and Minkari, are situated on a hill. The Pyramid of Khufu, the Great Pyramid, is actually a bit taller than the Pyramid of Khafre. So when you look at pictures, many people do mistake that it's Khafre, but it's actually Khufu is the Great Pyramid. And you will notice, if you look carefully, that the top of the pyramid is a little bit flat. And that is because the cap of it has been removed. Now, some people think that it was made of gold, crystal, ruby, or sapphire, maybe even lapis lazuli. Nobody really knows for sure, but it was probably some kind of conductive material. Looking the opposite way from the pyramids, from an aerial view here, you see that the city of Cairo is vast and surrounds it completely. And it is, of course, a major tourist attraction. When you look at it from the other side, on the outskirts of, or the middle of the city, you can see that, wow, <laughs> it's modern and ancient cast together. And unfortunately, there are times when the pollution is pretty bad. We don't know what's going to happen to these ancient monuments, but it seems as if pollution will take their toll. And by the way, I do want to mention to you that the Great Pyramid is the last standing wonder of the ancient world. All the rest of them have deteriorated and are gone. Today, they've gussied it up, I guess you could say. They have light and sound shows and lasers and all sorts of things that have kind of shaken me up against my romantic views, but that's what they're doing these days. So it is quite an attraction for people. I prefer, however, to take a look at the Great Pyramids, like this artist's rendition. In their time, they must have been absolutely gorgeous and gleamed in the sun from their smooth Tura hard limestone, which was white, from many, many miles away, a true, true monument. You will also notice that in the front there, next to the temple, is a river. And guess what river that was? I'll explain it later. I do want to give you a little bit of a background. My interest in the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx 
started when I was about nine years old, and my mother bought me a Wonder Woman comic with a story about Wonder Woman and the Sphinx. It was not actually either one of these. I haven't been able to locate it yet, but in the story, Wonder Woman goes down a ravine and finds an ancient Egyptian civilization, complete with pyramids and Sphinx. Of course, she's dressed kind of oddly, speaks a strange language, and the people there did not understand her. They thought she was an enemy. So they locked her up inside the Sphinx. She managed to get out through the mouth of the Sphinx, probably an analogy for us, right? But she, she climbs out of the ravine, gathers some evidence to convince these people that there is a modern world of which they're not aware. When she returns and convinces them, they together decide to climb out of the ravine to see for themselves. And as they do so, these ancient people disintegrate one by one in the alternative atmosphere that they're not used to. So that was my introduction, and it probably had something to do with becoming an anthropologist, and later on in studying all kinds of ancient artifacts and uh, skeletons and the like. But anyway, to go on, fast forward to 2007, I became interested in Nikola Tesla. A Nikola Tesla and a zero point energy. And I decided in one of my talks to see if I could uh, find any ancient evidence of peoples using zero point energy. And so I decided to look at the Sphinx and uh, the Great Pyramid. And I did so in July of 2014. I also gave a talk in Boulder at the Society for Scientific Exploration. And this by popular request, apparently, I'm back to give you an updated version of some of that. And when I was doing this particular talk, I wanted to know, did ancient civilizations know about and actually utilize zero point energy technology? And what was the evidence in various parts of the world, including pre-dynastic Egypt? I wanted to know what we could learn for this, from this and if uh, their technological uh, innovations were equal to our own. About how long ago was it? The first thing that I want to talk to you about are the myths of the Great Pyramid. Currently, this is the way most people think about it. The ancient Egyptian civilization, the Great Pyramid, were dated at approximately 2500 to 2400 BC. That's one point. Number two, it was constructed by 10,000 slave laborers, oppressed laborers, I should add, over a period of 20 years using ramps and pulleys and also using simple technology and crude copper tools. Finally, it was composed completely of quarried limestone and granite, granite that was imported from the Aswan area about 500 miles um, upriver, and that is the Nile. And finally, as the story goes today, it served as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu, uh, the Greek name for him is Cheops, and that was its sole purpose. But my data and my research shows that this is not the story at all. In fact, the newer findings tell us this, that the ancient Egyptian civilization Great Pyramid may be as old as 12,500 years ago, 36,000, or even as old as 60,000 years ago. Also, it suggested that it was constructed by 5,000 laborers who were well taken care of and paid over a period of four to five years using various sophisticated and also simple methods. They had an advanced technology beyond our ability today. The pyramid was composed of quarried limestone, granite, and also reconstituted materials, including an unidentified mortar. In short, the view that I have seen, as well as others that I have researched, is that the Great Pyramid was a geomechanical negative ion pulse generator that we use, was used for energy production and communications. First, let's look at some dating methods, just so you get a, an idea of how this was determined. There are various kinds of chronometric dating methods, oral histories, the hieroglyphics of the ancient Egyptians, and the writing of those 
travelers who came after. What we use today mostly for this type of situation is radiocarbon-14 that has a half-life. And this is how it goes. When you have a, a piece of something that has carbon in it, that carbon uh, deteriorates or radiates, uh, half of it radiates every 5,750 years. So by finding out what it originally had and then how much is deteriorated, you can find out the approximate age of the object. Some other dating methods might include dendrochronology, which is tree rings, if you've got a piece of wood. And we also have stratigraphy, paleogeology, and paleoclimatology studies on which we can draw. This is a, a graph showing you some of the time ranges here, and not all of these types of dating methods apply, because actually there's not much that's remained behind in the Great Pyramid, or the Sphinx for that matter. But what we're looking at primarily is up to 50,000 years ago and earlier. Some of the newer technologies that are being used um, with the Great Pyramid include microgravimetry. There was a study done in 1980, and this is where small differences in the strength of the gravitational field are measured. They, they've also used their ground penetrating radar and the newest thing is the Scan Pyramids Project, which was initiated in 2015. They've got a particle physics muon technology, or moonography. And this is where muons are collected, deflected, or absorbed by a hard surface. They do pass through voids. So they study the accumulation of these in order to find where the voids are. And there is a big effort going on right now to find any other voids within the Great Pyramid. In addition to this, there is thermal scanning or infrared thermography, and finally, 3D laser scanning projects of various kinds. So let's go into a little bit of the background of the Great uh, Pyramid. It starts with Her Her Herodotus history, and he is the father of history, the field of history, and an ancient historic, historian and traveler who visited Egypt about 450 BC. Uh, I'm pronouncing that wrong, that's Herodotus. Anyway, he included a description of the Great Pyramid in a history book that he wrote and that has survived. And in it, he details what Egyptian guides told him. So it's their version of the history that he's repeating. They told him it took 20 years for 100,000 slaves, oppressed slaves, to build the pyramid, and another 10 years to build a stone causeway connected to a temple in the valley below. He all further stated that stones were lifted into position by use of immense machines. Now that I have starred because our version of a machine may not be their version of a machine. A machine to them may be a system of levers, pulleys and the like, but we don't really know what those are, but there are some suggestions that will be offered. And then finally, Herodotus said that the purpose of the structure was as a tomb for the Pharaoh Khufu, as I said, which is also known as Cheops. Now, fast forward then into 820 AD, an Arab, Arab by the name of Caliph Abdullah al Manum who was the governor of Cairo, tunneled into the Great Pyramid, and his object was to take the treasures that were reputed to be there, because it was a tomb, and all these tombs were constructed with treasures for their uh, pharaoh. Here, in his attempts, he discovered a secret entrance, which you see at the left there. What he did was, he's he was so angry that he found nothing whatsoever in there of any importance, a few sticks and stones, that he was angry so he decided to strip the pyramid's white Tura limestone casing to use for public buildings in Cairo, which he did. And after he was done with that, he tried to dismantle the pyramids. He only got so far because it was so immense and so heavy, he finally gave up. Here we have a picture of the Giza Plateau as it was discovered in the 1880s by explorers. You can see it was pretty much covered up with sand, 
quite different than you find it today. Here's an aerial view by Udvard Spelterini from 1904 when he took a balloon up and took a picture. What I'd like to point out to you is the village of Nazlet el Saman was there at that time. It was a village consisting of a few, maybe four, maybe six families, extended families. And then there were also what looked like moats around the Great Pyramid and the Middle Pyramid or Khafra. Uh, these are important to understand. And then finally, over there at Menkari's Pyramid, pyramid, you see a sort of a oval indentation, which some people have suggested was at one time filled with water. The Great Sphinx today has been completely dug out and is probably almost continuously in the process of being rehabilitated. You will see in the front what looks like bricks was probably an addition later. We don't know how later that might the top of the Sphinx is of a harder limestone and below a softer one. They have dated this at between 12,000 and 15,000 years ago. This is not the standard story. How can that be? A gentleman, a professor by the name of Robert Schock, uh, associate professor of natural sciences at Boston University with a BA in anthropology and MA in geology and PhDs in both geology and geophysics, he is the one that came up with this. And he, came, he created quite a little sensation with his version of how old these things were. In fact, here's a newspaper article that was comparing the Great Sphinx as being as old as that other picture there is, uh, the discovery of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which is also dated about that time. And he has done this through a hypothesis with his version of water erosion. And it certainly is very obvious and is pretty much accepted today. By this type of erosion, understanding the climate and the water at that particular time, that there was a lot of runoff. And he proposed that it could be even older than 12,000 years ago, both uh, Explorers Robert Bonval and Graham Hancock believe that it may have been built as early as 10,500 BC, which is about the same time frame here. In addition to this sort of water hypothesis, a couple of other people, archaeologists Sharif L. Morrissey and Antoine Gijal, published a controversial discovery of a sea urchin fossil attached to one of the blocks of the Great Pyramid. And this urchin developed in such a way that it had to have been in salt water and it was in its prime. So it was salt water that it was living in, suggesting that salt water had indeed inundated the pyramids. And the evidence shows that there are watermarks up to 14 feet in the pyramid during a period of major sea flooding, about, others say, 12,000 BC and in the Great Pyramid is about 200 feet above the base. Now, some other investigators, a famous one, John Anthony West, suggested that the Sphinx and the Pyramid were dated about 36,000 BC, which would be one whole processional cycle earlier, or 25,800 years ago. Since every 2,150 years at the vernal equinox, the position aligns with a different constellation. And in this case, 36,000 years ago BC would be the sign of Leo the lion. Now he bases this on the fact that he believes that his great sphinx was actually a carving of a lion or a cat to begin with, as you can see in the pictures above the sphinx. So that if it put it, if that was aligned with that particular constellation, that would be about 36,000 BC. Here we have a picture of the face. It's been defaced through time. I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, there are people who believe that perhaps because of the later religion that became popular, that 
The Sphinx was actually originally an Anubis. Anubis, as you can see in the upper, upper picture, is the god of the afterlife, of mummification, and the transport of the uh, deceased to the heavenly worlds. You will see, however, that that mummy case is lying on what looks to be a lion head, which I think is very interesting. And personally, I feel that because of the stones involved, if it was an Anubis, it would be very precarious indeed to not break off and crumble. I feel that that's probably unlikely, but I think further research would uh, put an end to that one. Other people really go along with the lion or the cat suggestion. In the upper left-hand corner, you see many examples of lion-headed people, as well as other kinds of animals. In the right, you see a picture of a sacred cat. There are all kinds of mummies of cats that were considered to be sacred. So why should that be? Now, one reason may be suggested by a book called The Serious Connection by a lady by the name of Marie Hope, who thinks that if the Great Pyramid was aligned with the Orion constellation, then that would make perfect sense. Here you see Orion. Uh, this would be, of course, aligned with certain tunnels that exit from the King's Chamber within the Great Pyramid, and I will be discussing this a little bit further. Okay, she goes on to talk about this in yet another book called The Bashats and the Crystal People. On the right, you see a figurine, which is in the Ulm Museum of Germany. And in it, this, this particular figurine was discovered in a cave in Hohenstein, Stadel, Germany, dated at 32,000 BC. She discusses this in her book. She quotes the German researchers as stating the figure first found in 200 pieces in 1939, had breasts and was obviously a lioness, human, female. So uh, this seems to suggest that lions played a very important part in their early society. Could the Sphinx have then been a lion or a lioness? We really don't know for sure, but it is suggested. Now looking further at the Great Sphinx, Take a look at the figure on the left. It shows that there is a notch or a knob, and um, some visionaries have suggested when that knob is turned, it will open up the Great Sphinx to its treasures within. When you look on the right, you will see from the older pictures, there is a hole at the top of the Great Sphinx, and there is a man looking out from it in the picture directly to the right. Now, I also want to mention one more time that the area in front, which you see at the bottom, is not of the bedrock construction, but was artificially made later on and added to it, which is interesting. So what about these holes? There is a hole in the Sphinx head. You can see it in the picture to the left, and the picture to the right is a more modern one where actually that has been covered up and there is actually a manhole there. What about that? What does that mean? Well, there are people who have claimed for a long time that there is an interior to the Great Sphinx of chambers both in it and under it. These pictures are sourced from the Kemet School, uh, which was started by the wisdom keeper of the Egyptian traditions. An American archeologist, George Andrew Weisner, from 1867 1942, stated that the Sphinx in back was hollow. And during his excavations, he was restricted from full access by the authorities. These are just artists' rendition of what it might have been like. I was unable to find any other sources of more accurate information. But we do know, for example, from Edgar Cayce, who predicted that there were rooms, chambers below the feet of the Great Sphinx, what they're finding, like especially from people according to like Graham Hancock and other prominent researchers who are doing ground penetrating radar, there are in fact chambers and tunnels all over the place in the Giza Plateau. So you can have an idea of where some of these are located. 
We have here a picture of Tom Danley, who is a sound engineer, and he was responsible for some of the uh, data in terms of sound resonance within the Great Pyramid, and he was also going to check out the Sphinx. And he and a team went down there to document to this, and it became a uh, award-winning documentary narrated by Charlton Heston. It was called The Mystery of the Sphinx, New Scientific Evidence. A team went down there to investigate this. They were able to get a permit to go inside the Great Sphinx. They went in through some tunnels to a bifurcation there, but they were blocked from entering into whatever chamber was there. However, we do know that it is true. You can see there in the lower right-hand side, there is a rear entry point to getting into some of these rooms. Here we have somebody climbing out of it. So he was not able to tell us anything about what he found, but it is true. And I really have no further information about that at this time. Now I'm gonna turn my attention to the Great Pyramid. Did the Pharaoh Khufu really undertake construction of the Great Pyramid as has been claimed? Here he is on the right. He was the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty, living to about 2566 BC. Now, the evidence I found is that two Americans, James and Francis Breasted, came to examine and collect artifacts and information from Upper Egypt in 1906, and they took an inventory of everything that was in the fourth dynasty, including the stele of Khufu's daughter, which you see there on the right. Same information came with Gaston Maspero and M. L. McClure in a famous book at that time called The Dawn of Civilization, published in 1894. Gaston Maspero researched and concurred the legitimate acts of the life of Khufu, and he was able to uncover, including the information on the stele, that the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid already existed at that time. The text states that lightning once struck the head of the Sphinx and Khufu recarved it, presumably in his own image. And he also undertook renovation of the Great Pyramid. The same information was reiterated by Zachariah Sitchin, who wrote in Mystical Journeys of the Past, where he said, well, the fact that in the words of Khufu himself, he did not construct the Great Pyramid. Is, is, that's what we go by. And it also, he also stated and repeated that the Sphinx was already in existence. Now let's look a little deeper at the construction and what this Great Pyramid actually is. If it's not a tomb of Khufu, then what is it? The principal investigators that I wish to credit First of all, are Abdel Hakim Awan, who is the wisdom keeper of the ancient traditions, and it is carried on by his protege, Stephen Meller, who is a local Egyptologist living in Lafayette, Colorado, as well as Hakim's son and daughter, Patricia and Youssef. Some other people I wish to acknowledge are Edward Kunkel and Stephen Myers, who came up with the water pump idea, which is part of the story initially. This was later looked at by a, John, by a man by the name of John Cadman, who did extensive research also. And he thought it was uh, the Great Pyramid was a sonic machine and a hydro hydraulic pulse generator. Chris Dunn, who principally looked at the interior of the Great Pyramid, whereas Cadman looked at the subterranean part. Dunn thought that it was also a sonic machine, which produced hydrogen and was a microwave generator. Nikola Tesla found his inspiration with the Great Pyramid when he was constructing the Wardenclyffe Tower for wireless energy. I had been studying Nikola Tesla, so I found it interesting to compare the two. And finally, I'm looking at uh, an independent researcher, David Sarita, who says that the Great Pyramid was a quantum harmonic oscillator. That is a little fancier name, but goes, it goes along with all the rest of it, as you will see. There are many others from the past, J.O. Kinnaman, William Flinders Petrie, 
and a variety of other people that have all contributed to the information I'm about to present to you. And I would also like to thank the Great Pyramid of Giza Research Association, Tesla Tech, and the other professional and independent researchers. So what about Hakim? Hakim, the wisdom keeper, on par with other wisdom keepers in the world from the Aztecs to the Hopi to the Maya and many others across the globe. He was born in that little village I told you about earlier called Naslet El Saman. And at a very young age, he was chosen by a female tribal elders to become the keeper of the keys, the wisdom keeper, and to transmit the true indigenous teachings of the ancient Egyptians. He has PhD degrees in archaeology and Egyptology. He's well aware of the standards of the disciplines. He spoke eight languages with an understanding of Egyptian hieroglyphics and the other ancient tongues. He served as professor at Cairo University. In his later part of his life, he was a tour guide where he very carefully would talk to people about what these ancient teachings had to provide with due respect to what is being taught today. He founded the Kemet School of Ancient Wisdom. Kemet refers to the ancient people. Actually, Kem refers to the land itself, and it was called the Black Land because of the fertile soil that was deposited annually down the Nile River into the Delta area of Egypt. And finally, Stephen Miller and Hakeem's children became his protégés, as I've mentioned. Unfortunately, Hakeem passed away in 2008, and the traditions are now carried on by these people. Here we have Hakeem and Stephen Miller. Uh, Miller has written a very good book called The Land of Osiris. I highly recommend it if you want to learn about the ancient people and some of the things that Stephen has uncovered, as well as his, his history in doing that. He has an MA in a different field, I guess, but he considers himself, and so do we, an Egyptologist with 30 years experience of research. He's an affiliate of the School of Chemitology that teaches all about the ancient traditions. And he's a very busy guy, even though he lives in the area. He conducts, conducts teaching tours of Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Scotland, and Ireland, where there are other monuments of antiquity. Now let's look at the site itself. The Great Pyramid lies on a great node of the ley lines of the planet. And it's directly there that many people think that the underpinnings of the Earth, the pulses of the Earth itself, come through to the surface more easily than other parts or other nodes of the ley lines. So some people would say, oh, well, that is the center of the world via the ley lines, perhaps, but it is a central point noted in many ancient writings as well as modern ones. Vital statistics that are mind blowing, but worth mentioning a few of these. The Great Pyramid, has been at times called a record of the past, and it contains many secrets for us to unravel. But here are a few things to know about it. Besides being located at the center of the Earth's energy grid, as I said, there are many astrological and astronomical numbers that are encoded in, it, in the building. For example, the sum of the base sides is equal to the precession of Earth's axis which is 25,920 years. Its latitude equals the speed of light in meters per second. The mathematical constants of pi and phi, or the golden ratio, are encoded in the measurements of the structure. And one of the interesting codes, which is the angle of the sides, which is not like some of the other pyramids of today, it is 51.51, a sacred number. It is designed around the two times pi times radius formula of a circle, or 22 to seven. It resonates with the Earth's resonance at approximately 7.83 to 8.1 hertz. Some people will say that it is resonating higher, but these would probably be at octaves, 
or harmonics um, of those numbers. It is built of about 2.3 million limestone blocks, some softer, some harder, but 20% of these, some say, are re-aggregated limestone. So they were manufactured limestone. The precision of these casing blocks, which are the ones at the bottom, are 0 0.02 inches and weigh 16 to 20 tons a piece at five by 12 by eight feet. The regular blocks are about three to four tons each. It is a monument and a marvel. The indigenous teachings, according to Hakim, say that it was not intended as a tomb. Now these indigenous teachings were in the oral tradition, so this is what he says. That the Great Pyramid was some type of sonic machine and that it made chirping sounds, we'll address that. And it had been in existence before the time of the pharaohs, check that. Hydrogen gas came from the subterranean chamber, yes. And there is a buried tunnel that leads from the subterranean pit to the ancient Nile and a mechanical element that opened and closed it. So that suggests that there was something that was flowing through that tunnel that then emptied into the Nile, which logically would be water, and that certainly is true. Now here we have an aerial view again of the three pyramids, the Great Pyramid in front, Caffrey and Menkeri. You will see by the line that goes from the left over to the right and around, that is an interesting demarcation I'd like you to note. An ancient depiction of the past shows this, that those lines might well be what was called the Ur Nile, which drained into the Nile. It was a tributary. You will also notice that the Nile River was right adjacent to this area and that there was a causeway and that there was a harbor there as well and that the temple site, which is from the middle pyramid, Caffrey, down toward the river, was pretty much close to it. The Nile, just to give you an idea of the time, geologic time frame, the Nile River is now eight miles away from there. So what was happening? Remember I talked about the moats? There was a retaining wall or an embankment around the Great Pyramid and probably the other uh, Caffrey as well. And these were for retaining water from the Great Lake Morris, that in a moment. There were, as I said before, underground tunnels, lots of aqueducts, and the causeway removed excess water to the Nile and maintained static level for consistent pulsing. I will explain what that means. You can see in some of these pictures where these are. Now, in the middle of the graphic there, you will see what I call Lake Morris, which was called Wurmur. Mur is another name for ocean <laughs> in French. But beside that, it was compared to Lake Erie between the United States and Canada. And it was also 50 miles southwest of what is now Cairo. So it was pretty far away and it was pretty large. It has a very complex history and uses, one of which was in later pharaonic times was drained and used for irrigation purposes in times of less rain for crops. So there you have it, water was available and used in the ultimate purposes or original purposes of the Great Pyramid. What about construction? Well, I did a little bit of simple arithmetic and came up with this. 2.3 million years ago, or excuse me, blocks, I'm thinking, I'm thinking years, blocks divided by five years, as some have suggested, equals 460,000 blocks per year. Divided by 365 days per year means 1,277 per day. That divided by 5,000 workers meant that a quarter of one of these, let's call them the small blocks, were produced a day. So four workers could probably carve out these blocks using whatever methods 
and it was supported by yet another thousand support workers who might have transported these blocks. So I would say that it's not unreasonable if they were not oppressed slaves, but were in fact good, hardworking people who were well fed and taken care of by their uh, peers, that there were five workers could have in fact completed one block per day and therefore within five years, the Great Pyramid could have been built. There are a number of theories how this was done. The first was by a ramp and brute force. By just, you see this in the picture there above. Um, but what's an interesting thing about this, it may have been a technique used, is if you look closely, you will see at the foot of the pharaoh sitting there is a a person who is pouring, and it says the ske sketch above of a wall painting from the tomb of Jethuti Poktep, a semi feudal leader of an ancient Egyptian region about 1880 BC. That person is in front of the sledge pouring water onto sand, and it has been shown by studies such as that done by Amsterdam physicist Daniel Bunn that pouring water on sand reduces the friction about 50% in terms of moving it. So that may have in fact been one of the techniques used. If you go with brute force and or uh, a variation on that. Edward Kunkel came up with the water ram pump theory that using these retaining walls, they were able to float some of these early blocks uh, once the foundation was laid to bring in some of these blocks to start building. Don't know for sure, but it's interesting. A man named Chris Massey also came up with that in a fantastic series of water ramps, floats, locks, and wet sand to accomplish that. But it seems from an engineering standpoint that would probably be impossible, but interestingly done. The one that I go with is done by a French architect, Jean-Pierre Houdin who says he thinks that external and internal ramps and cranes were used. I'm going to show you more about that in a moment. And finally, others say, well, there may have been anti-gravity machinery. There is some suggestive evidence, but it's inconclusive. And I'll show you a little bit about that. OK, here's the Pharaoh's pump. I'm going to go into that a little bit later, so I'm just going to mention that as the pump was used to construct the Great Pyramid, at least around the, the initial perimeters, uh, by floating blocks on barges. Chris Massey, if you want to take a look at an interesting theory that probably doesn't work, it was very well done uh, animation. Uh, here is the link to watch that. Here is Jean-Pierre Houdin's rendition. He used microgravimetric imaging from the top down to show that our eye is in fact a kind of a Fibonacci spiral at play here where he thinks ramps that were spiraling around from the inside were used. And there you see that in the graphics to the right. And then they used a system of pulleys and leaders. So that may have very well been the way it was done. Another person, British archaeologist Walter Brian Emery, uh, discovered a very interesting disk that is called the schist stone. Schist is a sort of a weak form of granite, and it is very flaky and can fall apart. It is currently in the Cairo Museum, found in the tomb of a pharaoh, the fifth ruler of the first dynasty of ancient Egypt at about 3100 to 3000 BC. And some people seem to think this was a rendition of another instrument that was part of a machine that created a so sonic waves that were perhaps able to create anti-gravity or assist in the movement. And of course, we have the examples from Beats Gallen with the Coral Castle in Florida. As an example, he was able to move huge blocks by himself with a machine that he concocted and able to move these blocks by himself. Uh, however, that mystery, that information has been, has been lost in time. We're not really sure how it's done, but people are still trying to figure it out. Now, looking at the composition of the Great Pyramid, 
is supposedly built all out of blocks, chopped up or whatever, carved by workers. But a chemical engineer named Joseph Davidovitz takes exception to that, and he's done extensive studies on some of these blocks. Here you see on the right where the quarries were and where people more or less think the blocks were carved from for these different pyramids. Below, you see what the strata look like from the Mokotam formation and the other uh, limestones that were there, the soft and the hard and so forth. But he thinks that they were reconstituted, some of them. In the next slide, you see how. You see on the right, you see below the carved blocks, and then the ones above that are very close together, very perfect and uniform. And then you see a few in there that look like they were either didn't quite pancaked maybe, or they shattered to a degree. And it looks like they shattered not haphazardly. But anyway, he says his analyses show that they were reconstituted. That means that they were ground up, mixed with other things to be made harder. A man by the name of Barsoom believes that the pyramid tops, the backing blocks, and the inner and outer casings were cast from this reconstituted limestone. There may not be many of these left because they have been pillaged by former uh, leaders who wanted to use them for building. But the cores, he said, were probably composed of the carved limestone blocks. So that was his hypothesis, you see. There was also a type of mortar that was used that they still can't figure out what the composition of it was. So that's, these are some issues that some people are for this theory, others are not. Now, the Great Pyramid itself, was it a sonic machine? A hydraulic pulse generator creating negative ion pulses and how? A transducer of mechanical to electric energy? And I do want to explain that because of the aquifer below and the limestone and the water, because of the composition of the limestone blocks, the granite, which contains a great deal of crystal material, you know, like 52% crystal in its composition, and the conductor up top plus the shape, or what was happening with the sonic pulse generator was that it was producing a piezoelectric effect, which was disengaging some of those electrons becoming ions, and it was sending it up to the top, creating an energy right at the very tip of it. Now, in addition to this, the pyramid apparatus also produced hydrogen and generated microwaves, according to Chris Dunn. I'll show you that evidence. And others yet say that it was a quantum harmonic oscillator. And yes, I think it was all of the above. Chris Dunn, a engineer, high-tech expert in all forms of machining, tooling, lasers, in the aerospace industry and beyond. He wrote a book called The Giza Power Plant, highly recommended. In 1998, he produced this. And I believe that he was very astute in what he saw there. He describes the Great Pyramid as a holistic energy device, harmonically coupled with the Earth and its inhabitants. I will be describing this for you. And he was said it was built to provide a high, highly technical society with energy. In short, it was a very large machine. And in fact, if this becomes commonplace, these ideas, in fact, I think that the Great Pyramid was perhaps the biggest, greatest machine ever built. Chris Dunn shows you some examples where high technology was used, both in the angles that were carved out, in the smooth planing, uh, and you see some examples here in the rock where some kind of drill or saw was used, and how could they produce this? Other examples that he looked at, not the pyramid, but the symmetry and precision, say, of the Ramsey statues at Luxor. He says the symmetry is so perfect, it could not have been done by him, but was done by precise machine. Another example of that is here with the striations on the uh, 
it looks like the clothing of the pharaoh there. That could not have been done by hand that simply and precisely. The other gentleman who is the genius in this discovery is John Cadman, who is a marine engineer and a fluid dynamics and hydraulics expert, as well as machinist. And he has a website. Uh, he is a breeder of Black Russian Terriers. And so he's put this information on his website for his, his uh, breeding business. And that's where I found it. He's not out there. Both these men, you know, have put their information out there and they don't make a big deal of it. It's up to us. This gentleman was the developer of the hydraulic pulse generator theory of the Great Pyramid. He built a scale model that works without electricity, which is gravity fed, fed, fed and I'm going to show that to you. He was first inspired by Edward Kunkel's 1962 book on the Pharaoh's pump, which I'll show you. And he discovered further that the Great Pyramid has both fluid and acoustical dynamics. So together, Cadman and Dunn are giving us a major picture of how this machine worked. Here is a cross section of the pyramid. I'll look at the subterranean chamber first and then go up in finally into the main structure. The subterranean chamber, or pit as we call, is reached through a tunnel, a descending passageway that goes from the top, where if you see at number one, that was probably the retaining wall. There was water in there at one time, and it was regulated. There's all kinds of valves and plugs within the pyramid that have been discovered, and they're granite plugs. Nobody knows how they got in there, but they're used for regulating water flow and airflow, I believe. So there you go. Here is a picture of that. At number seven down there, there is a passageway that has not been completely excavated and also at number eight. I'll explain what these are. Here's how it generally worked. The water came from Lake Morris, maybe through tunnels into retaining wall, and was let down by a check valve open down into the ascending chamber where a pumping action was created. This is called a water ram pump. Now John Cadman did a miniature of this in property in his backyard, a spring fed, and he did his very best to create this to scale. And here you see it operating, he's with Chris Dunn and it's still operating today, and it chirps, interestingly enough. He tried several models and failed. It took him about three or four years to get to this place, and the pressure inside of it was so great that he had to construct it with steel rebar, epoxy, and concrete. There you see it, that red box. Now here we have the descending passageway, and this is what it looks like. You see some of the water flow going down in there. Okay. And by the way, there is a short passageway called the, to the grotto, which doesn't quite go down to the pit, but it has a purpose. Okay, here's a cross section made in 1929 by the Edgar brothers. The water comes down, there's a recessed area, it enters into the chamber. And I'll show you what happens when you do that. And this is very like the hydraulic ram pump, but it's been modified. Okay, so when you're looking at the top of it down, in the top picture there, where you see a small recess, you're looking down on it, you're seeing some structures that are fins. And then in the middle, you see what is called a pit. And then you see a passageway going out of it. Well, it's better described over here in the lower part of it. See what the fins look like. It's a huge room, 55 by 30 feet. And the water comes into an entrance. It comes down at a 45 degree angle or so. Enters into the chamber, 
exit at the cul-de-sac, which is 53 feet so far that they dug out. And then I'll describe what happens when that water goes in that chamber. Here we have the north entrance is where it comes in. The south exit, which is smaller, is where it went past the room in there. Here is a picture of the subterranean pit where the water, after it is sloshed around, and when it comes back, and some of the water that doesn't go down the other opposite channel comes back, swirls around and drains. Here you see the west wall and the fins, which are great, and the ceiling over there on the left, greatly, greatly eroded. Now what happens with water in this passageway, two things are happening. First, there's cavitation of water by the water and also the, the composition of the limestone together. When you have this sloshing, cavitation occurs where you're, because water is composed of oxygen and hydrogen, some of the hydrogen electrons are forced off of it up into the air. That's the cavitation process in the swishing, the violent swishing that's going on in there. Now the oxygen being heavier goes back down in the water and the hydrogen, which is a much lighter gas, as you may know from the periodic table, it rises to the surface. So that's what's going on in there. Now there's more though. Here you have John's model. It must have looked like early on, and he's done this to scale once more. So the water comes down to passageway in there, and it passes to an output line where there's a check valve. And then that comes back as a compression wave, which I'll show you, swirls around with the other water and goes to the waste valve that goes to the Nile. When it comes down to the output line, which you see on the right, okay, and on the left, you have the wastegate assembly, it's called. At the end of this 53 or seven feet, there is a granite block, which they call the piston. It's also tuned to 440 hertz. The water flows, a little bit of it goes around it and out, which they think to the, the temple and to the Nile River. Whether that's been excavated yet, I do not know. But what happens when it hits this piston, it creates a backflow, as you see in the lower graphic. The fluid motion, and remember John Cadman is a fluid and hydraulics expert. He says it pushes that block, maybe, and it's fluid with the water, easier to push, pushes it against the wall where it stops, and then it recoils and it creates a rare fat fraction. Let me say that again, rare faction and compression waves that goes back into the chamber. And what happens when it's there? As it's going down the drain, it hits what he thinks, speculates, is a reflective elbow at an angle so that the compression waves comes back up is a major standing compression wave and is aimed at the queen's chamber and the king's chamber and the acoustic chamber above for a purpose. But what purpose is this? These are also, by the way, called shock waves or standing waves. And how this happens, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, the reason is a reflective elbow, he thinks, but we don't know this for sure yet is because then the waves that go back, right back up. If it were a bent channel, the compression wave would spread out in many directions. So that would not be a good, uh, a good sound wave at all. Now John did a lot of studies, hundreds and maybe even thousands of pictures. He installed these ink studies where he wanted to watch the flow of how this worked when it was operating which he did. These are complicated, but follow me if you will. The upper left, the water comes in from the descending path, passageway, and some of it flows directly into the exit. And some of it, which is 
shown by the orange line. Some of it is circulating around and swishing. And you see that in the picture to the right of it. it. Some of it spreads out. Then when it comes back, that's the red line. It is swishing around, okay, in various ways. And as all this swishing then starts to drain into the pit on the lower right. So he's done lots of these studies about how it worked in there. As I said, if you look at the right picture on the right-hand side, there is air hydrogen removal. So not only do we have a standing wave that is created by this with compression waves going up above, up into the pyramid, but we've got hydrogen formulating and it is removed in this fashion by the red arrows. You can see that in the upper left where John Cadman thinks it was channeled to because it's going up to the top of the ceiling is a light gas and it is being filtered out that way. And there is evidence of a recession wall in there. Whether it's been excavated, I do not know, but that was his hypothesis. So what would happen is this gas is not shown on this cross section here, but would go up to maybe hook up to the ghetto, would go directly to the queen's chamber, but some of this gas may also have been fed up to the grotto area. The grotto. There was a chamber there and a shaft. That, and the purpose of it was like a check valve. It was a shortcut for reverse shock waves to reach air. So it was a, re, it was a relief for some of the air through the shock waves that were happening. It regulated the pulse of the pump acted as a standpipe, okay. It maximized the pumping efficiency and intensity for the shock wave, not for pumping of water, which he discovered in his descriptions. It reduces reverse surge out of the descending passage and allowed the drainage of fluids entering the queen's chamber. So what was that about? This is where Chris Dunn comes in and he calls it a power plant. You can see here, Okay, we'll link the two now. He calls the Queen's Chamber a reaction chamber where the hydrogen gas was processed. And it was processed a number of ways, which I'll just discuss with you. But then some of this stuff went into the resonator hall where certain signals were, what shall I say, tuned. It was a, a tuning mechanism went into an acoustical filter and in a resident chamber that we call the King's Chamber. And here, there was an amplification of the standing compression waves for various purposes. And it was also a place where they were able to create a microwave signal output, which I will explain. Here's the Queen's Chamber with Hakeem in the middle and you can see in the upper right, that there is a lot of, it looks like, burning of the chamber that has gone on. But there's no evidence, nothing was found in here, nothing, it, there could have been an apparatus or something in there. It's really hard to determine what was happening there. And then in the lower diagram, you will see the dark lines. These are tunnels that go horizontal and then go up at an angle, but they don't go all the way out to the surface of the pyramid. Why is the question. Well, a fellow by the name of Rudolf Gantenbrink discovered, maybe part of the reason, or started to discover it, when he was doing a project to air condition the pyramid. So he put this little robot, which I call up and out, probably not pronounced right, but <laughs> in 1993. And here we have on the right, Eric von Daniken giving us perspective of how small and how precise it was, carved, drilled. At the end of it, what did they find with their camera on this thing? Two metal pins that they think are electrodes. And that was confirmed later. 
What did they find in there? Now on the horizontal plane, before it rises up, as you can see, there's debris there, and the two pictures on the top. They found the same things, objects, that a previous explorer found in other tunnels. They were wrapped and weighed down with a piece of timber or stone. The one on the right is a modern hexa hexagonal iron rod with threaded ends, which they think was left by a previous explorer, Weinman Dixon in 1872, because that really doesn't belong there. But what were the other objects? Same objects found. So there are at least two of these, maybe more, of these sets. A bronze grappling hook, a small gray-green stone ball, and a broken piece of cedar fragment, one of three that is in the Marischal Museum of Scotland. These were lost for a time. I don't know what has happened. They've been, people have been trying to retrieve this. They're cedar fragments and quite possibly then can be carbon-14 dated. That's what they found. Nobody really knows what these are for, but they are suggestive. Then in 2002, the National Geographic Society launched a second apparatus called the Pyramid Roper into the shaft. They drilled a hole and wanted to know what was on the other side <laughs> of this. And the cameras were rolling. It was on live on television with a huge audience watching. But all they could see on the other side was another slab. There was a small chamber and then another wall. Finally, in 2011, the Dejed rover was launched with a better snake-like mount that was a little more flexible and a camera that you know, looked around. So in the back side of what they called Gatenbrink's door, which was the first, the first door, when they looked around the top, they saw metal loops with corrosion. And what looked like that black line shadow there a disintegrated conduit. Now they think that it was metal and used for possibly electrolysis because the one on the left had white corrosion and the one on the right had black. That's what they speculated. These shafts were extremely difficult to construct. That's why I think they were constructed before the other layers were laid down. Uh, no other pyramid has such shafts and it's also 200 feet long. So we've got first the Gatenbrink door with the electrode or metal loops, and then in the back we've got the Hawass door. I don't know if they have penetrated that one yet or not. What did they see on the floor? They saw from the Dejed rover, they saw mysterious red markings behind the door, which they called possibly wiring instructions. So how did that work? The upper left shows you how they thought the wiring might have gone, which would account for the electrolysis. Well, why the electrolysis? And that's a bit of a long story, but it's for creating hydrogen gas from electrolyzing water, just as they had done in the subterranean chamber. Now, there's yet another hypothesis that's been produced. I don't know what the evidence is, but they think that after a while, uh, actually chemicals were used. I don't know if they have found evidence of chemicals or not, but the hydrogen can be produced by mixing certain chemicals. From one shaft, hydrated zinc chloride, and the other, the solution of hydrochloride acid would have produced hydrogen. So here we see it, two things, compression waves and hydrogen gas. What is all this for? So now we'll go into the grand gallery. And here's a picture of it, grand gallery with corbelled walls. There are those, including Chris Dunn, who believe that these this is a perfect setup for what they called a gallery of Hemholtz resonators, which could fine tune any frequency you like. There's some modern Hemholtz resonators right there below shown, and these are like tuning forks. There are some evidence that there were 
round vessels, a few with what look like horns that could have been used, and these are in museums, could have been used as the resonators. But that is, that is what they believe it is right now for frequency tuning. If they go along with the whole idea of, it, um, of tuning hydrogen gas. Now resonance in the king's chamber, finally. There was an antechamber, which you see on the left-hand side, which they think contained baffles for regulating resonance and harmonics. And the whole chamber itself, which was built with uh, these great blocks of granite, which are high resonators and also tuned. And they were specifically tuned, and this is something that Donnelly, the sonic guy in the film, the mystery of the great Egyptian Sphinx and the pyramid, that film that I mentioned earlier. Everybody now seems to think that it was specifically tuned to the F-sharp harmonics, which would be the harmonics of the very Earth itself, and the harmonics of the humans and all the other life on the planet. So it was a resonance chamber. They're pretty sure about that. Here is a better graphic of it. You see on the top there, on the right-hand side of the left, diagram, you've got this tunnel coming into it in a number four, coming in and going out. These also have access to the air on the outside, so they're tunnels where something is being uh, channeled into it and coming out of it, and it's being fine-tuned and it's being filtered through the baffles in the uh, antechamber in there. Now, in the middle, number three is what's called the sarcophagus, that's because that's what it looks like. It's another micro box, resonating box. Here's what it looks like in there. Here's the entrance, here's the sarcophagus, and the precision with which it was made, which is unbelievably precise. They think that the king's sarcophagus was a resonance mini chamber for F sharp and his harmonics, and when amplified, it they called it the singing stone, which was or, which chirped when it was pulsed by the compression waves. So there you have back to the indigenous teachings, the chirping sounds that were noted. So its per first purpose was to resonate with the Earth's natural frequency or mechanical energy and convert it into electrical energy, which was focused at the apex of the pyramid into the atmosphere. Now through the piezoelectric effect, the pressure thereof and the release of negative ions, that mechanical energy of pressure is then converted into electrical energy. For those of you who need to know more precisely. I'm going to skip this. If you have time to write it down, this is an interesting way of telling us how that actually worked in there. It's not completely correct but it shows you about the cavity resonators, the piezoelectric effect, and so on and so on, how kinetic pressure transmutes into electrical and so on. Now, further, not just this compression wave was had to use. It was an oscillation in resonance. It was a maser or a microwave amplification through stimulated radio waves. The signals came into the acoustic filter and it, the hydrogen gas was tuned and amplified and a microwave horn receiver sent the signal out into space. Let's look at that more closely. Okay, on the bottom part, we see a modern hydrogen maser and on the left, another diagram of it. And this is what was so amazing. The low pressure hydrogen gas that made its way up into the chamber is submitted to a higher frequency radio ray discharge tuned by the gallery and the signal input. The emissions were repeatedly amplified in the cavity to a higher energy state. It was pumped by the resonance of the cavities below and the compression waves like a maser would do, pumping it 
the resident frequency of the microwave cavity that is tuned to the frequency of the hyperfine energy transition of hydrogen. That's exactly what they did. They tuned that hydrogen to a, a hyperfine state. And then a fraction of the signal in the cavity was then sent and pumped into a coherent receiver, which you see there as the microwave horn receiver. And it was shaped just this way. It was shaped that way, so it would be coherent. If it was square or something, it would not go through. It, it would not uh, go through that tunnel in the same way. This is how they made it coherent into a beam, so to speak. So the second purpose of that chamber and of the pyramid was as a hydrogen maser. Chris Chun describes this amply in his book, which is an acronym for microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The radio signals emitted through the microwave horn receiver into space. Now, we have the SCAM pyramid project. I'm going to hurry through this because I want to get to some other important things. Zahi Hawass has been noted as being pretty much synonymous with the Great Pyramids and all of the research into the pharaohs and the tombs of that great place. But now there is a, a project underway, scanning the pyramids for more, um, more voids. So let's take a look at this. One is a three concurrent muon tomography projects where they're sending muons through it and above it from different angles to determine where the voids are. And it will go, muons will go through, there are subatomic particles that will go through um, a void and they'll hit a hard surface and that could be studied. They found two, one above the Grand Gallery and one at the secret entrance. And they're studying these and they think more shafts and so on will also be discovered through their studies. Here is a picture of it. It's not very large, but uh, this is where they're located. And they're using 3D laser imaging and having fun with that to see it in three dimensions where the voids actually are. There's also been scan pyramids with infrared thermography showing us that there is a greater energy going up the sides of 51.51 degree angles and culminating at the top. And the difference is uh, a couple of degrees, but that is significant. And there's also a rather anomalous uh, place that's been found on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid here. So this is using infrared thermography. What they will find, we don't know. They have not informed us. Yet another one, another study of electromagnetic energy has been done by a German group, a Zentrum Hanover, Laser Zentrum Hanover, and this is where they're applying theoretical physics methods to investigate the electromagnetic response of the Great Pyramid to radio waves. And here you see, this is really interesting, you see that little blob in there is the King's Chamber, but below it you see tremendous energy that extends from way below the Earth's surface up through the aquifer up above. So that the calculations showed in the resonance state, the pyramid can concentrate electromagnetic energy, radio waves in its internal and subterranean chambers. So that was also another wonderful study published in, the, in 2018. So here we have aquifer, and that's the wrong picture because that's uh, Caffrey, but just pretend that that's the Great Pyramid here. So we've got the compression waves going from below, and we've got all this electrical energy going up. Just the natural configuration of this they had calculated would be about 14,600 volts. Just naturally uh, would be the magnetic field charge that you would experience on the top. The second right-hand graphic is the shape energy, and it shows that it is concentrated on the sides, like we saw with the thermal studies, and it's also in the middle. The term pyramid means fire in the middle. So that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? We see examples of this with Karuian imagery, energy created by a Tesla coil, 
you see it in Sumerian pictographs, the one on the lower one, the snakes there symbolize the electrical charge. We can we think we can see the charge actually in the whole environment, which must have been very helpful for the land, the people, uh, the animals, everything would have been a helpful resonance in harmony with the Earth's resonance. If this picture is a real one and not been manipulated, then we can see that it would actually have an effect upon the cloud structures as well and, and could in, in fact enhance and encourage rain in the area, perhaps. Picture of a guy, seven minutes, climbed up to the top of Caffrey, I think it was, from the looks of it. Uh, it's illegal. He got away with uh, not doing three years of jail time for that by eliminating the pictures, but later he had an app that could retrieve them. And so that's how he got this selfie. What's important about this to tell you is that I had a friend who climbed the Great Pyramid back in the late 70s before it was illegal. Went with several people, had a guide. The guide had a uh, wine-soaked uh, cloth hanging from the back of his jeans. And when they got to the top, it started on fire. It started to spark. And that's because of the static electricity at the top. He said, my friend said it was very palpable to feel the energy, electricity at the top of that pyramid. And what must it have been like, naturally, <laughs> with a capstone that was a conductor and or all this other apparatus that must have created quite uh, an electrical current of negative energy. So here we have it, multiple purposes, maser, you know, a laser, because think of it, it is like a giant laser when it has been pumped and amplified. And in fact, it is a marvelous, wonderful transducer. And I don't know if we're running out of time here. We might, I'm just going to keep going. There are people who think that certain, there are certain indicators that the ancient Egyptians did in fact have electricity and that they were able to produce it by the Dejed pillar with a transmitter at the top and receiver by the graphic on the side. And it was said that between these two antennas, a soliton or vortex field was generated and it was used for some of the heavy building blocks uh, to carry them, to put them in place. Whether that's real, nobody's been able to duplicate it, but if you see the king's chamber, the way it's constructed, Looks very similar that way, does it not, to the Dejed pillar. On the lower left, you see a configuration that has both uh, a receiver and a sender. That one, people say, looks like a grandy uh, a grand of a generator. I'm not pronouncing that right. Sorry, I'm getting tired. I need to drink water. Time out. Van de Graaff generator. Then on the right, let's back up a minute. I took a break and a swig of water here. On the left, you see a Van de Graaff generator, or that's what people think that it is. On the right, you see some sim similar configurations that suggest that there is a transmitter and a receiver happening here. In the middle, you see Tesla's oscillator which would be a transmitter, and his version of a receiver. Now, is there any coincidence to these shapes? I think so. Further evidence that they had electricity is shown at the Temple of Hathor in Abydos. This is dated about 2250 BC, and it's called the Dendera Lights. You see in all of these pictures of the reliefs, what looks like the transmitter and receivers, do you not? And in addition to that, you see what looks like electricity in a large tube. Now think about this. We know that there was, that, that torches were not used in the construction of the great tombs of the Pharaoh underground. Nobody knows for sure how they really did it, but I think they had some form of electricity. 
because there's no scorching on the ceilings. The frescoes and the object in there, sure, they were dusty, but there's no evidence of any burning of any kind. Now, the problem is we have not discovered or we are not aware of any discoveries publicly of any such apparatus that would have produced electricity for them. But take a look at this next slide. This looks exactly like a Crookes tube. It's called the cathode tube, an early form of electricity that was invented by Sir William Crookes in 1870. It looks an awful lot like that, don't you think? And here we have a wall carving of the lower crypt of the Temple of Hathor at Dindu, once again, that shows us these apparatus, the transmitter and receiver. Nikola Tesla certainly got his inspiration from the Great Pyramid when he was conceiving of and building his widened Wardenclyffe Tower. I won't go into this too much, but here he is at Colorado Springs with his Tesla coils testing out what he was about to prepare. And here is his early Wardenclyffe Tower, which he was building between 1901 and 1917, when he didn't get funding from J.P. Morgan, because apparently Morgan did not like the idea of free energy for all, and it was abandoned, but Tesla had a wireless world system that he wanted to create by these towers, transmitting energy and using the Earth's resonance as well. When I took a look at this, I saw a great many comparisons, which I think is worth sharing with you. Both had aquifers, both were using the Earth's resonance. They both tapped into what we call zero point energy or free energy out of the vacuum, which is <laughs> it is packed with energy that we don't normally tap into. Okay, it had a subterranean ground, resonated with the Schumann cavity, and produced a high voltage. It was connected with the ionosphere, and its purpose was the same, wireless energy and communications. Tesla also used pulsed amplification a different way, and both were harmonically tuned. So they had a lot of things in common in different ways. But what was different about the two, I think, mainly, was that the ancient Egyptians used all natural processes, whereas Tesla used the same principles, but he also used man-made things, including electricity. And he had a magnifying transmitter and so forth. But they were essentially doing very similar things, in my opinion. One more note here. I'd like to mention is the investigator David Sarita, who has done a lot of work with the har hidden harmonic codes of the Great Pyramid, which he regarded as a quantum harmonic oscillator. He said, the pyramid was replete with harmonic codes. It created a magnetic force field, yes. Faster than light speed communication, which he says is based on the frequency of 51.51. .51. That's a long explanation I'll let you research. He said that this was a stargate to our solar system, the galaxy in the greater universe. That could very well be. It could have been used for anti-gravity purposes to reach the upper atmosphere and away from the Earth's magnetic field strength, but uh, make it much easier. And he said it was also, and many, many people studying the Great Pyramid agree with this, it was a tool for exploring our inner as well as outer dimensions through energy, frequency, and vibration. In fact, the Great Pyramids in more recent times have been explored by people looking at how subtle energies of these structures can assist with healing and uh, self-awareness and enlightenment. There is some evidence to prove or suggest that this is actually not that far-fetched because NASA is doing some interesting studies with hidden magnetic portals, which the Great Pyramid would have done. These are called X-points or electron diffusion regions. Now, what was produced there by the Great Pyramid was a stream of negative electrons 
that were diffusing out into space. And they are like a little bit like wormholes, I guess you could say. Uh, in many respects, they were portals that connect Earth and other magnetic fields like the sun. So there is an article one can research to read more about this. So what can we say about all of this in conclusion? I think all of this suggests that we need to change our point of view about the ancient Egyptians and their capabilities, which in many respects exceed our own. That their civilization was far more ancient than we have been led to believe. The Sphinx, the Great Pyramid were much older. Their purpose is much more complex than we've been led to believe. And I think the Great Pyramid itself was a machine, not a tomb for the Pharaoh. Nothing of that sort was ever found that was comparable to any of the tombs of the Pharaohs that came later, for example. And that the evidence highly suggests that it had a mechanical purpose that was later perhaps used as a more of a spiritual purpose. But in the early days, it was a compression, uh, elect, uh, mechanical to electronic amplifier, and also it was used as a maser. So these all suggest that maybe there should be a paradigm shift in the way that we view these ancient peoples, as well as their works. Luckily, this last standing monument of the seven wonders of the world is still standing and we can still ponder its uses. I'm sure more evidence will come forward about what has been discovered in some of these chambers that, like beneath the Sphinx and perhaps even within some of the chambers of the Great Pyramid and the tunnels and chambers below it. With that, I'd like to say so long, farewell, good night to the Great Pyramid of Giza. And I will take at this time any questions and answers because we are doing this separately from our original, where we lost our Wi-Fi connection, I'm sorry to say, uh, but I am still open to any comments or questions if you would kindly send them to my email address, Suzanne Odette at msn.com. And with, with that, I would like to say thank you so much to Gloria and, Gloria and the Caritas Center. Um, we are very grateful, grateful to have this opportunity. Thank you so very much, and good night.